out in Zoom land? Would anyone out in Zoom land like to have privilege of the floor this evening? Uh, yes, I would please. Mr. Gorley. Yes, um, just to, for, to introduce myself, my name is Tim Gorley with Tract Engineering. I'm calling and following up on behalf of HL Robinson. We had submitted a comment and received a letter back from Gene earlier this week. And I just wanted to follow up on that and I appreciate the response and uh, acknowledging our comments. And we look forward to uh, reviewing the next draft to make sure that our uh, interests in the town are being uh, heard and we'll work with what's being proposed for the zoning application. Good, thank you so much. I, I sent Mr. Gorley the definition, the mining definitions that we had written and said that tonight we would, we would accept or perhaps change them, but I think that's where we were. And that as soon as I had the, um, the final uses table, I would send that to him. So. Okay, and yet at this point, you have not finished up that use table, correct? Is the way I'm understanding it? We have, we I just didn't have it in front of okay. me to be able to send it to you. Okay, I mean, that's, that's all I really want to follow up on the discussion just to make sure that we're on the same page and that we would expect something so we could comment on it if need be. So, yeah, you, that's all right. Exactly, that's what I'll send. Well, okay, okay. I, I, I was going to bring up your letter tonight because I didn't know if we had gotten back to you or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, great. Good, thank you. Okay, uh, I mean, that's, I'm not going to stick around, but I just want to make sure that that kind of got in and, and then make sure you knew that we were kind of, we're still paying attention and following along with you, so. Thank you so much. Okay, all right, thank you much. Um, before I close privilege of the floor, does anyone else like to speak? Raise your hand or thing, nope. Don't see anything. Please. I don't see anything, okay, good. I am closing the privilege of the floor and going on to the business meeting. So um, we have the minutes of April 14th, and April 26th to accept or change. And I will make one change is I totally messed up on uh, both Ernie and Bruce were nays on the water resources um, uh, overlay. And I uh, didn't have a chance to go back and listen to the meeting, which I always need to do in order to check myself because my minutes are, my notes are sometimes lacking in actual writing things down. So I will change that in those minutes. And with that change, um, would anyone like to move those two weeks of minutes? Someone wave at the screen. All right, I'll, I'll move the minutes from those meetings. Thank you, thank you, Bill. And I saw Michelle waving as well. With that, does anyone else have anything they need to say about the minutes? Then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so those are now passed with that change. I will make that change and get it out so that it can get up on the, the corrected version can get up on the website. Um, Tim Murray. Hi everyone, so sorry to have missed you last week. I was out of town on business for the first time in maybe two and a half years, which was strange. Um, happy to be back. The town board is meeting tomorrow night at seven o'clock um, hybrid. So you're welcome to join us. Okay. So, um, Nan isn't on yet, though I'm assuming she will be here very soon. Um, I should have started, she wasn't able to be here this week, is that right? right. Yeah, so I, I, I just looked at her email, she can't come tonight. Right, I forgot. Uh, so, I think we have a couple of things to follow up from last week. Is that right? And then we need to do the, the terms and move on to the terms and definitions. So the only thing I can think of to follow up on from last week is, I think we finished the map and we finished the mine. Uh, Jean? Right away, yep. Uh, I actually wanna offer an amendment to the mining definition. So okay. I don't know if we can do that now or later. Um, I think that's fine. Let's, let's, um, is it change the table or is it a change, is it a change the of the table or the definition? Yeah. Uh, in the definition. Okay. Then we'll leave, then we'll wait until we get to there in the, in the terms and definitions. Okay. Okay. So I think we're starting at letter C. So, um, 
Can someone put put the latest version from Dan <coughs> up? I think. Um, uh, yeah. Let's see. I I could probably do that if no one else. I think I have it handy here. Just one second. Great. Um, I had sent an email wondering if we needed a few more uh, terms, you know, abbreviated site plan review and, and all that. Um, we'll, so we will, yeah, I, I had, I wrote those down. I think it was abbreviated site plan review and what we need to write them if we're going to put them in. And yeah. Uh, so, and so I'll make a list of other things that we need. Okay. Can I make a? Sure. I'm following the first terminology, which was sent 4622, because I went through the whole thing and made comments. Uh -huh. So it's kind of hard to follow along. And the other thing is, on the last one she sent, it would be really nice if the pages were numbered so that you could find it. Could yeah. find it. I, um, I think I could manage to do that from home. So we'll. All right. So I just got, I, I see, oh boy. Um, I have updated definitions for 2622, but I think she sent something after that. I probably got it? it. So if you and make... it's uh, it's probably in my other on my other computer that didn't get into this folder for some reason. I can so do somebody it. else. Okay. Okay. Because I, I might have it, but um... 2722 was the last one. Well, then she said one that had like with mine, you know. I can't, you know. If BK and EB comments. I think that's the one we're working from. Oh boy. So if you make me a, <laughs> a, a co hoo ha, uh, yeah, we I will do that. Are you, are you on the meeting? Oh, you're right. I'm not. I can't do it from here. Uh, right, okay. So, so which, which, which version do you want to see? I think that one that says updated definitions for 2622. Okay, I, it's I, actually, I, it's actually 42722. Yeah, I think there was one after 26. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, it's a document that at the top says uh, 42722. And it was, uh, I believe it might have been a 428 email. I think you're right. Uh, Barb, uh, if you have it there, can you share it? Here it is if you need it. Uh, probably, but um, I. I don't want to be the one who has to take notes on it, though. <laughs> can take um, notes on it. Well, no, because um, yeah, wh whoever's got okay, it on screen okay, is the one who yeah, has I guess to type you, into it. Yeah, let me see if I can do this. All the joys of virtualness. All right, that's his four twenty. Do you see that? Yeah. That was right. That's the one that came on four twenty eight. So that, okay, that might be the one I have then. So I thought there was, oh no, I, yeah. Okay, that's different from the one I have. Okay. You got it. Right, because this has the changes we made last time, like deleting mobile home in it. Mm -hmm. And here I am trying to scroll the document, which is somehow not working because, you know, Barb's computer doesn't pay attention to me. So <laughs> what, what do you want to be on? Let her see. We went past B already? Yeah, we finished B. Okay. So are we going to circle around back again? Because um, I had some you know, thoughts on the average lot size definition. And okay. why don't we battery. just start with A again and see what anyone has an issue with? Average lot size? Because because Nan changed a few things. So it's. Do you want to oh. talk about affordable housing? That was new. Yes. Or would it be possible to enlarge the uh, what you're sharing? Thank you. I think we might lose the comments, but yeah. Okay, so this was affordable housing was something we do need, um, and uh, so yeah. I mean, you know, Tompkins has a typo in it, but you know, change that um, now. So I, I think I'll read it for people online. Dwelling units inhabited by households whose annual income is within 80 to 120% of the Tompkins County median income 
with adjustments for household size as defined and periodically updated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the annual rental cost does not exceed 30% of said income, or for homeowners, the annual cost of the sum of the principal interest taxes and insurance and common charges as applicable does not exceed 30% of said income. 30% is generally considered affordable housing, no matter what your income is. But I think uh, in terms of what we're talking about, the first sentence, um, the first part is, is absolutely accurate in terms of what um, planners consider affordable housing. And the only place that this occurs in our document is in reference to uh, incentives that we're granting in the event, uh, you know, the, um, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, yes, I believe that's right. Uh, yeah. 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 So, all right. So, so I, just, I just don't know if this will, you know, I assume that somebody thinks this is workable. Um, yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the workability part. So I think. Uh, I don't think there's anything else in here as I'm growing down. Uh, Agritourism is the same as it was. Is applicant new? I don't think so. No. 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 Average lot uh, size. Yeah, because you know, Nan worked on that and changed that because of some, some things we have. Right. Average so lot size. Yeah, so you all you guys all got my note and and you know my attempt at, at wording and again I think part of the challenge here is that on a simple level average lot size is a mathematical concept that says you average the size of the lots that's okay. easy, but what gets wrapped in here is essentially the policy implications of that given what does that mean, and I just think that um, it, it's a it's a fundamental concept we don't. Have, Nan here to sort of check what I, because I didn't see if it in late emails, but what I tried to demonstrate is that it's, you can't just say that whenever you divide a parcel, it has to be, you know, the sizes has to be, you know, greater than or equal to the, the dwelling, you know, the minimum set for that zoning district, because there are times, you know, in the second or third or fourth division of a parcel, well, that won't be true, as far right. as I can understand it. So I don't think Nan's example helps a whole lot. And so I offered alternative wording and I'll, I'll read it here. Um, and I don't know if it's the best way to go, but I'm just, we could just stop with, you know, my first sentence is the average size, you know, average lot size dash, the average size of all lots created from subdividing a parcel, semicolon, mathematically, the original lot size divided by the number of parcels after subdivision. And, you know, that's what average lot size means. But then I did add the policy statement to make it clear why we're talking about that. And this is the part where things might get messy. It says, for zoning districts where a maximum density rather than a minimum lot size is specified, the average lot size of all subdivisions of any parcel that is in existence when a zoning law is created must be larger than the minimum density specified for that district. And I'm realizing I could pop this up if people would think that better than just listening to me rattle on. Um, but what, real question is, is there any traction for this? Do we want to just keep what Nan has there? Um, but again, the concept is when zoning is passed, all the lots in existence essentially get evaluated and the number of dwelling units they can ever have on them is that size divided by three if we stick with a three dwelling per, eight, per um, three acres per dwelling limit. And that's what, why average lot size is important in the zoning draft. So, Bill, I, I think I excerpted from your document and I uh, oh, just look at that. pasted in the average lot size. Thank you. It's like magic. But you, you said average lot size are bigger. So, if it come under, we weren't rounding up anymore? Or uh, no, so it says that, you know, it, 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 this does not describe the rounding part, which that goes in the text, I think, because you know, um, definitions are definitions. So I, I would, I agree, we need to specify how that is a rounding thing. Um, what it just says is that it must be the last sentence larger than the minimum density specified for that district. So, you know, if you have a 20 acre parcel and you divide it into two pieces, your average size is 10 acres, that's definitely bigger than three, 
no problems. You have a 20 acre parcel, you wanna divide it into 10 pieces. That's average lot size of two acres. That's smaller than three, that's no good. So, you know, whatever your, you know, number comes out to be, it just has to be larger than minimum density specified for the district. And then the only wrinkle comes in is where we start talking about original parcel. And as Michelle pointed out, we may have to somewhere define what that means that that, you know, I tried to use words here and maybe that was more complicated that it says somewhere about um, uh, from a parcel, any parcel in existence when, is, when a zoning law is created, ah, i.e. original lot. Thank you, Barb. Um, yeah. So yeah, so so I, I read that a few times and was a little befuddled about it. But as far as after the zoning laws passed, you create a subdivision, and now that subdivision, that size, no matter how many times you divide it, is the original figure you're using, correct? Yes, it always refers back to the, the original size of of that parent parcel, maybe we would call it, yeah. you know, the, the, which becomes yeah. a grandparent eventually. It doesn't yeah, change and with every time it's subdivided, like that new subdivision, now that's your size lot. So it's- Yeah, so like, like, in, like, in the, like in the figure I put out, you know, parcel A, which is like the original parcel, from now until that, you know, kingdom come, that parcel A can have its size, which I put 20 acres in there, divided by three dwellings on it. That means seven. When and how you create them and put them on there, you know, could be any size parcels in, in there, but seven is the number. Um, and that will ever be within that box that was defined by the original parcel A, no matter how you subdivide it later. Does that- yes. Yes. I mean, this seems to require some yeah. record keeping and, and all kinds yes. of stuff. Is there, yeah. is there anything fundamentally wrong with just saying it is what it is? You know, that if you take your 20 acre parcel and you divide it into two, you've got two 10 acres parcels. And the next time you want to subdivide that, you've got to look, you know, you take a look at your 10 acre parcel and you say, I can do three right. lots there. Yeah, oh. here's, the, here, here's where that gets into a problem. <laughs> Take your 20 acre parcel and someone says, I'm going to make two one acre lots over there. That's certainly fine. But now they've got an 18 acre parcel. I want to divide that again. Okay, let me make another two one acre parcels. So now I have 16 acres left. And it looks like I'd still do another five housing units. That means I would have gotten nine. So it doesn't work to do it that, the other way. Yeah. So, and there, there are plenty of communities that do this kind of record keeping. Yeah, it's not okay. impossible. Yeah. I'm I, sure and, um, yeah, I just thought it should be something myself. But it is a little so. So basically, right now, you know, the assessment office does keep track of parcels. What actually gets more complicated is that what work you know, parcels can be subdivided. They call it splitting. The opposite can happen. Par parcels can be merged. Uh, but there are deeds and things that keep track of all that. And on the tax assessor website, you know, they at least, and I think realtors can access that, the, the, the deed history and see how things got divided. But yes, there is some record keeping. If all there ever was was splitting, I would think the record, keeper, record keeping would not be too onerous. But given that there is merging, I don't know how that actually impacts this. If a piece that was subdivided off of parcel A winds up getting merged with parcel B. And so what I wish we had NAND for, and so we may have to put this off till that is, I don't know in practice, other than if it's first come first served, who gets to like, you know, in the example I gave, some of the small parcels wind up getting divided up. What I don't know is if you ever have a system where when that first subdivision happened, essentially those seven dwelling units were allocated you know, across the parcel as to who had two and who had one and who had three. I don't know if it works that way or if it's just, well, the next person to subdivide, you know, um, get, gets those those dwelling units if, if they subdivide first. So it's um, kind of like who subdivides first makes the money. Well, I don't know. I see, but see, I don't know if that's the way it works. It may be that instead, when that first subdivision happens, there's a legal agreement that says, okay, this parcel can subdivide again. This other parcel can subdivide two times. I don't, I just don't know how it works in practice. And we need NAND for, for that part. So I've written that, that down as a comment. 
I think, Bill, the thing that you did that was um, um, like a drawing. Yeah. I think that was very useful for me to understand what you were talking about. Um, could you put that up if you I have that? Well, yes, uh, Barb uh, will have to stop sharing so that I can share. Okay. Yeah, because I, I want people on, on the thing to see what you're talking about. Because this did not make, it made much more sense to me as an infogram or whatever the heck it's called. All right, so all right, so so you should be seeing, you know, again, let's say we have this original parcel A of twenty acres in size, and if it's in a in a zoning district where there are the uh, density maximum density is three acres per dwelling or one dwelling per three acres, I should say, um, then. 20 acres divided by three is just under seven because we're rounding. That means there can be seven dwellings on this parcel uh, allowed. Now, when you subdivide, you don't have to put seven dwellings on. So I gave an example of a subdivision that might happen where someone divided the parcel into four pieces of various sizes, very cleverly giving road access, assuming there's a road here to this back parcel. And this is allowed, right? Even though, again, this is the whole point of the average size is that this two acre parcel totally allowed in the agro because it's not that you can't be under three acres, just the average of all these parcels had to be greater than three. And, and it is because it's four parcels made out of 20 acres makes five acres per, you know, on average. <clears throat> and, you know, say boom, 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 maybe four houses go in. Then several years later, this is the, the key part, someone wants to divide. So what was a four acre parcel here could get subdivided. And again, there's no limit on, there's no particular specification with the size. So people can do whatever is convenient and worth, you know, the, that works out for what their planning is. So this person could have sold off an acre by the road and made divide two other acres, one for themselves and one for the, their kids or whatever. Um, and even though, and this is the point, you know, in, if you look at just this piece, you say, oh, that, those are all smaller than three acres. That doesn't average a three. That's correct. But that's not a problem because you look at the whole original big parcel. And in that, you now have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. So the average size is that 20 acres divided by six is still greater than three. So that was allowed. So this is the, the, the key thing that I think to understand. And then we're saying you go to a few, few years later, maybe the guy in the middle, gal in the middle decides they want to subdivide, just split themselves roughly in half, that's fine. But at this point, there are now seven pieces of this parcel and it cannot be subdivided further. So if this person here wanted to subdivide, it would not be allowed. And that's how the average uh, lot size formulation for the agro zone works. As I understand it, and I, I think this is correct, for exactly the reason we sketched up earlier, that if you just say every time you subdivide even some sub parcel, you have to have an average of three, you can wind up in a situation where you wind up with a lot more dwellings on that 20 acres than the seven that was the target. So uh, what I have done is I've written down the new definition, which I think we should accept or not accept. And I've written a comment that says, how do we do the record keeping and practice and who gets to do the subdividing? Is that part of someone selling it as a deed? Which it could right. be. You might pay more for property. I think it's gotta be. Yeah. It's, it's you might run with the deed. Right. You, you know, may the, you the, might pay more for property if you have the ability to subdivide. Yeah. And, and I, in a previous conversation with Nan, when I was first you know bringing this stuff up with her some time ago, she said, yeah, it, it definitely turns out in situations like this that there are people that buy 15 or 20 acre parcels you know, and they cannot subdivide it. I mean, I think that's sort of a known thing. And, you know, that may or may not, I don't know how that works in terms of, of it depends how the market would value that property. But so, yes, it is definitely possible to buy a large parcel when this kind of thing happens, um, where there is few subdivision op options left. Right. Um, and what I just, what, again, what I don't know is, do you set up a legal agreement here in this very first step you know, when this is subdivided, is there some legal agreement that says how many this one, this one, this one, and this one have, or is right. it just first come, first serve? 
I think that we need to consult with Anna, with Nan about how this is normally done. And I, you know, I can imagine I've, I've got 26 acres. Right. If I was going to at some point, you know, subdivide my property and I wanted to sell and somebody wanted to buy 10 acres and the right to subdivide it into two pieces, I might sell them that and then I might sell somebody else something else, you know. I can but, see how that would go. And that to, would go along with the deed. It has to be legal. Yeah. Because I could see the guy sitting on seven acres now the way it's worth a lot less money because he can't do anything with it. Right. But he would have known that from the beginning. And, and presumably that would be reflected in market rates and therefore his assessed value and therefore his taxes would be lower. Right. Um, and, and, and Gene, my guess is that actually either can happen, that you could have a legal agreement specifying number of subdivisions that go with each and or maybe it could be left blank and then it's first come. But that's the question, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that so, just seems like a nightmare. That's like a, yeah, that would be a nightmare. Yeah. No, I mean, it should obviously run with the deed that when you subdivide a property, you're going to allocate the free, the subsequent subdivision possibilities to mm -hmm. each lot and it's going to become part of the deed. In the deed, correct. Um, that sounds good to me. Then when somebody buys that, have that, they say, oh, okay, I can only subdivide this one more time. Um, and, you know, and, and, yeah. and then, you know, the, I mean, all of these subdivisions are going to come up for um, you know, some sort of review. That uh, actually, none of these would come up for review. What's that? No, none, of the, none of these would come up for review. Because they're all under the threshold for Right. I mean, you, you, it, 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 it's, you have to have more than four under five acres. This one only had two under five acres. Doesn't meet the threshold. No review of this subdivision. So somehow we got to trigger something that gets written into the deed when the subdivision occurs. And so that throws up a red flag to the title company when you go to exchange the property to the next guy. Yeah. And, and, and I tend to agree to that it'd be good if it was in the deed. I just don't know if, if our zoning law should specify that it has to be that way, or if we have the authority to specify that it has to be done that way. Maybe we do. I would think we would have to because it would turn into a real ball of wax or a battle if somebody, you know, yeah. said, okay, I'm going to divide three times and it's, you know, hell with you. Right. No, I, I agree with that. I, I think it's better if it's. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and we can go back to looking at the definition. And I think we have some key questions there then to. Uh... Right, so uh, you have the original um, average lot size definition that we got. And we also got this one from Bill and maybe Barbara can put that back up again. Yeah, I would, I would like to be able to read it and go over it before I vote on it. And see if people are. And there's no way I'm going to read that. Uh, I can read it aloud to you. Yeah, but still. Get that one? Yeah. yeah. It's, I'd like to it's a one in red is the new bit. one. The average size, I'm going to just read it for everyone. The average size of all lots created from subdividing a parcel. That's average lot size. Mathematically, the original lot size divided by the number of parcels after subdivision. For zoning districts where a, mid, where a maximum density rather than minimum lot size is specified, the average lot size of all subdivisions created from any parcel that is in existence when a zoning law is created, i.e. the original lot, must be larger than the minimum density specified for that district. So Bill tried to write this um, so that it would stand regardless of whether there was a three acre lot size or a whatever for the, right. yeah. I'm having a problem with the must be larger than the minimum density specified for the district. Give me a, fill me in on exactly what that. Yeah, and, and, and I agree that, the, the, you know, it's like those double or triple negative things. So the minimum density specified, for example, in our law for the ag rural district, the minimum density is three, uh, three acres per dwelling. So the three is the number and it's three acres um, per dwelling. So the average lot size, you know, the average acreage of the lots must be bigger than three is how that means in actual numbers. And in a different district? 
Well, so we don't have any of the different districts that have an average lot size specification because all of our Hamlet districts have a minimum lot size. But if it were, this is where you're leading me to, you know, if we had specified a five acre per dwelling density, then whenever you did that first subdivision, you know, or in the, you know, the, the total for that originating parcel has to be bigger than five. Have we agreed that it's a three acre lot size in the we have to go okay. to the second draft. Yes, we have. Okay. Um, so, so what happens down the road when when the zoning commission comes around again and says, "Well, we're going to change to five acre lot size." What happens to all those grandfathered uh, subdivision rights? I guess they yeah, just I, need to exist. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Ernie. I wondered the same thing, and uh, we don't have Nan, so I don't think we know the answer. I mean, I, I think, think that. I mean, if you had like a, a 25 acre parcel still at that point, I think that suddenly you go from eight lots to five lots. Right. Um, okay, I'm gonna write that in here as well so that when we get back to Nan, we will know that. But before that, do I have agreement on, at least for tonight, on that this is an okay for average lot size? Yes. Mm, yeah, I think it's good. I think it's really confusing still. Yeah, yeah I, and I'm happy to, I, you know, agree. I, 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 I can, can tweak the language. language. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in yellow, meaning on my thing, but meaning that we have to come back to it. We haven't agreed on this part of the A so far. But I, I, I am and, going and, to and, 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 Okay, and what I will say is I think the only way this works out is that somewhere in the document, you know, doesn't have, you know, there's something written out in more detail with cases to explain average lot size. I think that the definition needs to be somewhat concise and therefore maybe a little sparse and confusing. Somewhere though, we have to have something that explains it more fully, but the definition is not the place. Where you have the policy laid out is where you then have a reader's aid box that steps through, this is what it means in practice. That's how I would, try to get over that confusion because I agree, Ernie, it's confusing. Um, and I'm happy to tweak the wording here, you know, because yeah, yeah. let us all think about this. It is in yellow on my document, meaning we have not come to agreement. Appreciate all the brain cells you burned up on this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> scary. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I'm looking at the curve and I think I've got another three months left. Okay. So <laughs> let's get this done. <laughs> okay. Um, battery energy storage system, we've done that. Is that correct or is this new? Uh, it was put in because um, she didn't have it one of the earlier ones. I mean, this is, and she went back and forth a little bit, but yeah, this is basically straight out of the battery energy storage law. So there's, that's fine. You know, if, if it's changed here, we're going to change the draft law, which of course, you know, that's fine too. But yeah. And the bedroom and the brewery, all those are also fine. Those weren't changed. Buildable area. Uh, Nan says that's fine. Uh, building footprint was fine. Uh, building height, I have something because Nan changed it. I okay, so what do you? What does building height say? Um, all right, so yeah, so the keep the first part is the vertical distance from the floor elevation to the lowest inhabitable space to the highest roof ridge or rooftop exclusive of steeples, chimneys, antennas, and other roof projections. I think that's fine. And then there's a sentence, which I, I know is fine and correct. I just wonder if it needs to be part of the definition. It says district building height regulations shall not apply to barns, grain elevators, silos, flagpoles, radio or television antenna, and you know a few other things, cupolas, chimneys, I don't wanna read everything. So, I, I mean, I mean, that's again, to me, it sounds like policy, which is fine. And I, I think it should be in the zoning law somewhere, but I don't know if that's part of the definition. And, uh, but it's probably not a harm to have it in there. So what do other people think? I think for purposes of clarity, it's useful to have there because there will be, you know, everybody will say, oh my gosh, my silo is, is bigger than that. And it's not a steeple or a chimney. So it must be affected by this. So I think just for purposes of clarity, it's useful to have that explanatory sentence. Uh, I agree. I agree. Okay, I agree. I'm fine with that. Okay. 
Now we're on to C. Yay. Can we can we back up the building energy model? <laughs> yes, we can. Yep. Can we make yep. that a little bit clearer, a little simpler, like a, a certified energy company or something rather than a physics-based model or simulation? A, phys a physics-based model or simulation to predict and analyze building system level effects and performance related to energy use. Yeah. So, so this comes straight out of the um, site plan law. So you know that, that's where NAN got that, and that's how it's worded there. Um, yes, it could probably be changed. Um, you know, just, or, or, or no, in pursuit, so or we could say, you know, what we have here, a physics-based model, da, 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 such as done by, you know, uh, whatever you use, the phrase used in energy, yeah, whatever so analysis company, you know. Company or whatever that's, well, there's lots I just of different make, ones out there. Yeah, um, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Ernie, you're probably better on this. Got to, <clears throat> to kind of make this a catch-all. Yeah, um, well, I was gonna say. That. And where this is used again in the zoning is for the incentives. Uh, uh, no, I think it also comes in again. It's in site plan, so so it, it, that predates incentives. We didn't have incentives, so uh, there is a because in 2018 the town put in energy efficiency uh, provisions in the site plan law. Various commercial buildings might have to produce a building energy model to prove that they are going to you know perform at a certain level. So it, it does not have to do with incentives. Right. I don't see why it's complicated. There's very few words in it. What's complicated about it? A physics-based model could be discussed and fought over, I would think. Why? Okay, long. Well, I mean, it could be... I mean, it could Just saying, it'd be pretty simple to say a, a, a energy... Uh, well, some I, I, some I, I, certified I, I, energy... There's, 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 you know, there's several different competing uh, energy modeling software right. things right. out there. And so, you know, naming one is going to be... Yeah. No, maybe one is not, is not good because, because then everybody's going to say, "Well, I don't know. Nobody uses that one anymore. Now right. we have to use this one." Yeah. Um, so oh, you're telling us. To I go mean, to I and Ernie, I'll take your two cents on this. I would be okay with it simply saying a model or simulation to predict and analyze with, and take the physics based out if if the word physics is kind of scary to people. I think the point is he doesn't want to be someone like using their thumb to say, "Oh, I think it's this." But I think any model of simulation is going to be physics based. But you tell me, Ernie, do we need the words physics based in there? I mean, I think that a a uh, a, a, a model or simulation predicting the analyzed energy related energy use, um, and then add you know two or three of uh, you know uh, you know examples include or something. Of, you know, rem rate uh, or performed you know, like by replica, are, um, replica. Know, or, or as a nationally recognized uh, energy modeling software, yeah, or a reputable company. I would think, well, you know, that's that, that's a that is no one agrees on a reputable yeah. company. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm putting this in yellow too. For well, so, so er Ernie, where you wanted to put the, that extra phrase, I just at the end, I would just say, uh, relate, uh, you know. Analyze building system level effects and performance related to energy use um, using a software uh, provided by a nationally nationally used. I, I don't know. I can't. I can't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> but um, I will come up with something. Okay, I'm putting that in in yellow also. Okay. We're going okay. on, and we're not. No more bees. We're going on to C's because that's what I said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Campsite. Uh, this is where we were starting. So a plot of ground with a campground. Anyone have any problem with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any plot of ground within a campground. I would leave out within a campground. Uh, any plot of ground within a campground intended for exclusive occupancy by a camping unit or units under the control of a camper for recreation, education, or vacation purposes. So you're saying that a campsite might not be within a campground then? Got it. Uh, but well, I, th I think the point of including within a campground is that um, you know me pitching a tent in my backyard right. is not a campsite because I don't meet the definition of a campground, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. 
which is a parcel of land upon which some number uh, of campsites are located. Two or more. Well, four or right, more. Right, but, but yeah, we, we're, we're going to discuss that number. That's why Barb skipped over the number. And I'm with Barb. I think the reason it says within a campground is actually to be, um, you know, to give a free pass to, to other, you know, right. idle forms of camping. And so I, I would vote to keep campground in. Or I, I argue in favor of keeping campground in. I agree. I agree too. I think that all makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to campground. A parcel of land upon which four or more campsites, including glamping units, I love glamping, are located, established, or maintained for seasonal up to 180 days occupancy by camping units as temporary living quarters for recreation, education, or vacation purposes, but shall not be, shall not include uses limited solely to the personal use of the owner. Uh, and it, of the owner of the campground, I think that's what it's referring to. An area for the gathering, parking, and use of land by recreational vehicles, a trailer park, or a motor home park shall not be construed to be a campground. So Nan's note is that the New York State law section for campgrounds defines uh, defines as far or more campsites are available. Zoning can set whatever you want, regardless of New York state law. You can have a campground that is regulated by zoning for two or more, but not regulated by New York state until they are five or more. This needs to be discussed. So what do people think? So, le so let me provide the background for this revision. Um, the, the original 1228 document that we're working from said two or more campsites. In the public comment and questions that we received and that we the zoning commission has responded to um, someone who is um, uh, involved in the in the review board process in, in the town uh, indicated that uh, that they believe that Tonkins County defines it as four or more campsites constitute a campground so that's why this was changed to four or more to to account for that public comment uh, that we got as a suggestion. Um, what Nan is saying is that New York State definition would be five or more campsites. We don't need to use the New York State definition, um, but I, I believe we should uh, do at least four, uh, change this to four or more campsites, but I would also be fine with uh, going to the New York State uh, 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 wording and changing it to five or more campsites. And at the point that they're five, then they become regulated by New York State campground regulations, which Correct. is for sanitation and, and all that stuff. I'm I'm not real sure about the, but shall not include uses limited solely to the personal use of the owner. In other words, the owner couldn't have four or five campsites there with people on them. Uh, no, it means the opposite of that. It means that if the if the owner is personally using four campsites on his property, that would not count as a campground, as long as it was like the owner and the owner's spouse and their grandkids. That's how I read this. That's correct. Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on the number. Um, if four is sort of consistent with Tompkins County, I'm fine with that. I do have a question about the last sentence as to why an area for the gathering and parking of RVs wouldn't be a campground. I mean, there are, that's what campgrounds of America often are, is little paved spots where you park your RV. So I'm, I, I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion one or the other, but I'm wondering why the parking and use of RVs is excluded from the, the campground definition, because it actually seems that they should be included to me. I, I think that's a good point. I agree we, with Bill. Unless we have definitions for those things somewhere else and we regulate them some other way. Um, I mean, I understand a trailer park, a motor home park, you know, those, those, you, you, those basically are permanent, right. you know, anchored. Motor home, motor home park, I don't know what a motor home park yeah, is. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, I don't either. Sounds like an RV park to me. Yeah, um, I mean, and RV parks are sometimes seasonal. They people, you know, camp there all summer. Uh, but they often have weekly tenants, right? Or daily tenants. I, I don't understand uh, why they were excluded. So, and, and motorhome park is the same thing. I, maybe they are regulated differently, the motorhome park. 
Uh, I think they do call them campgrounds. They're all over every lake, around every lake. Yeah. Up yeah. North, all over the place. And, um, and a lot of them have RVs parked there year round. I mean, it, it's it's kind of become a lifestyle. Right. Um, this is this is written as um, seasonal. This yeah. this definition is written as seasonal. And I guess the question is, what do we think about that? I mean, yes, because I think if it's not seasonal, that is something where it is parked there all year, then it shouldn't be a campground. We should think of it maybe as something else. I don't know what the something else is, um, but in yeah, yeah, a trailer park more like, and that should be regulated like like a trailer park. Um, but a seasonal is fine. Um, but I would have included RV use, um, seasonal RV use under a campground personally. Yeah. And probably motorhome as well. Um, so again, now we have a reason for not doing that. So we may need her experience. So I'm I'm uh, putting that last sentence in yellow to ask Matt about. I um, think that this is about season and a, a seasonal campground is my thought. I have no problem with personally going up to five and then having the. Uh, sewage regulated, which is really what it's about, is making sure that sewage is regulated and water is regulated. By being the threshold for where. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise. They're not. Uh, I think that makes sense. Yeah. So shall I shall I make a motion so we could officially either agree or, or disagree on this? Um, I move that the first sentence read. A parcel of land upon which five or more campsites, et cetera. Uh, I'll second it. Any more discussion? Yeah. Okay. What is, are we leaving this last sentence out yeah. at that point? At this point, we're going up to the period after owner. Okay. All right. That's fine. Period after what? Owner. The first sentence is what we're talking about. Okay. And then the last sentence on that period. We're going to talk to Nan when she gets back. So that would make this five. is. Are everyone in favor of going to five? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree. So we've done that and that's great. And we will leave that next sentence to talk with Nan about and talk it through. I'm going on to camping unit. Any tent, cabin, lean to or similar structure established or maintained or operated in campground or day camp. I don't know why we need day camp. As temporary living quarters, oh, a like day camp, like a child camp in the yeah. summer? Okay. As temporary living quarters for recreation, education, or vacation purposes, tents, trailers, cabins, lean-tos, recreational vehicles, or other similar structures used for temporarily housing workers shall not be considered a camping unit and are not allowed. A tent, yurt, cabin, or other structure adver advertised and used as a glamping use shall be considered a camping unit. All right, so yeah, it looks like that's gonna to have to work with the campground definition that there may be a reason because of this, why Nan didn't think RVs fit, were excluded from campground. I don't, you know, because here the RVs are kind of carved out if it's housing for workers, but the tent cabin lean to or similar structure does not seem to include an RV or a motorhome. And there may be a reason why that is. Because I'm pretty sure that people rent RVs, uh, you know, for friends for of mine have. Yeah, yeah. So my my sister has done that. Um, she goes camping and she rents an RV at a campsite. Yeah, the last time I ever went tent camping, people took their children over to show them a tent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't understand it. <laughs> I'm going to bring up the question again: Why operated in a campground? A camping unit could be. Because this is all part of the campground definition. I mean, these are all parts of the campground definition that we're dealing with here. Yeah, I think that's why. I mean, if you just have people to camp, like a couple of friends over to camp on your property for a summer while their house is being built or something, that's a different thing. It's not a camping unit? Nope. No. Right. In other words, nothing in the zoning would apply to that sort of use. Right. Is what I think is the intent here. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, campsite uses the word camping unit, and then camping unit has to be, you know, defined. Right. Um, 
I mean, this is all, all stuff that potentially would be regulated. I don't think you're advocating regulating personal camping on your property, are you, Bruce? No, no, I'm just saying no. camping yes. could be anywhere. It Not could, just but, in but, a yeah, no, but it doesn't have to be. We're in only talking about the ones in campgrounds. Right. Okay. We're so only so talking about those. Mostly okay. a way of, of, of counting what, you know, how many units or how many right. sites. <laughs> Through the series of definitions. So I think this issue about the RV, we have to ask a question of Nan about in here because we don't understand why it's not in certain things. Is yeah, that and it's also yeah. uh, this this thing about you know all of a sudden there's this sentence about you know blah 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 these will not be allowed in the town. You know, it's like whoa, wait a second. You know, yeah, that's that's. Yeah, so I'm is just. Is that what we really want to say? Right, I'm uh, I'm putting this in yellow as well. Um, cannabis dispensary. I think this is a, and cannabis lounge. I think these are the definitions that New York has because I actually have had to read this for a client. Um, and at the moment, these are not allowed in the town. But the town did that because they didn't know what the regulations were, as I understand it. So at some point when they know what the regulations are, which when the state publishes them, they may be allowed. So I'm sorry. a cannabis dispensary or a cannabis lounge. Oh, oh, oh right. so these are the and these are exactly what the state says. Yeah. Retail sale of cannabis or cannabis products. Um, cannabinoid hemp, it's, it's what it is. So I think those are acceptable. Everyone okay with those? Yep. Okay. Uh, car and motorized sales. The use of any land or buildings for the display, sale, rental, or lease of new- Jane? Or yep. So I'm gonna say, I mean, you know, in the interest of time, though, no, um, I'm gonna suggest you not read all the definitions. See how, okay. I, I mean- That's not- I personally, yeah, I personally don't have anything until we get to CO. I have commercial rec- and community character, but I don't know what other people, but maybe we need to indicate to you when we have questions. That's a good um, idea. Okay, so we've got, all right, question. So what's your question? I uh, just wondered about rental or lease. Should that be a separate thing? Car and motorized sales. This, this says, this says, Bruce, it includes language here, rental or lease. Okay. Yeah, it's under it. It's in the first sentence. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Should we have rental or lease under car and motorized sales? Should it be under it's a different rental or lease? It's a whole different. Oh, I see. Uh, it's not a sale. It's not a motor. It's not a car and motorized sales. How about if I make that first the thing say sales slash rental slash lease? If I do that, is that good? Got it covered. Okay. Yeah slash lease okay i've made that change yeah or it could be sales comma rental or lease but all right i don't want to quibble with words here yeah okay otherwise we're never going to get through this stuff yeah okay so car wash if you have a question when i say the name shout it out change of use church of religious use clerk of your review board cold storage facility commercial design standards commercial kitchen Oh, I have a, I just have a question about that. Um, okay. So I, I agree, you know, I, I've looked it up as well, and I agree that this is the definition of a commercial kitchen. My question is, um, what does something like the community, the Brookendale Community Center qualify as? Because I think, I think I, I've always thought a commercial kitchen was if you used a, a kitchen for commercial use, but that seems to not be the definition. Um, so what if it's just a big kitchen that uh, you know people make uh, big meals out of for uh, fundraisers like the churches or, or uh, the community center? What are those called? I think they are also are called commercial kitchens because they have to fit. They have to. They're regulated by the health department. Right. They have to have a certain number of sinks. You got dishwashing. Right. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But I mean, the thing about a commercial kitchen seems that that it's a shared kitchen and it's people rent space in it for their own no, I mean, a restaurant would have a little bit different what a private restaurant i mean a, a restaurant you know that's a commercial kitchen um, all right they're they're all regulated under the same same rules by health department um so what you're thinking 
is that this definition doesn't really work then, but these are the def this is the ones that we would be, it, does this fit for the zoning law? If somebody, for instance, built a commercial kitchen in a restaurant, then it's a restaurant. It's a restaurant, right. 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 No, I, don't they, think, I don't think there's anything wrong with I, this definition. I think the definition works yeah. for anything else. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just had a question. Like, I, I was just questioning it. That's all. I I agree that it works. Okay. Commercial recreation facility indoor. Commercial recreation facility outdoor. Commercial. Let's pause for a second on the outdoor one. I just I have a note saying that I agree with Ernie's comments, which probably was on the indoor one, taking out the motor the 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 prohibitory statement, and Nana's done that. And then it says add the uses in the last sentence of the first sentence. So scroll down. Show me. Commercial rec outdoor. Uh, oh yeah, so it's just weird that it kind of talks about these things are this, and also it does include this, but there's a lot of stuff taken out now, so maybe it's okay. Let me just look at it quickly. Uh, I mean, I still find it a little odd that we add another sentence tacking out some other uses and not just a longer set of uses in the first sentence, but I think it's fine. Let, let's not waste time on that. Okay. Commercial use. There, I think a lot of people had questions about this. Anyone have unhappy with where it is now? I, I think it seems fine. Okay. Common birds in steep decline. Common plan. See, community character. This was something that uh, yeah. just. So, so. I mean, I, I'm sensitive to some of, you know, the, the length of this document and community, you know, Ernie's suggestion that do we really need this in there? But again, from experience on the, on the comprehensive plan work, et cetera, people do want these sort of terms defined. And so here's, I think, a, a valiant attempt by Nan to do that. Um, I do think that when people are looking for, what do you guys mean by rural character? They're not gonna look under community character and go down to the second paragraph and see rural character. So I suggest that we have rural character, that paragraph moved to the R's and Hamlet character, that paragraph moved to the H's and do it that way. And then I did some minor tweaking of the wording, which people can like or dislike. Um, but that would be my suggestion about how to, um, you know, rationalize this. And then I think the wording that's left is, is not bad. So move the rural character paragraph to R. to R and move the Hamlet character to H. Right, so that's my motion. And Do I, I have a second? Should... I'll second it. Hey, discuss, anyone happy with that? Not particularly, but I'll go along. <laughs> <laughs> sanguine? Are you sanguine? <laughs> He's sanguine. Okay. I so, mean, the other option, the other option is we simply have under R, rural character, C, C, discussion under community character. I mean, that's fine too, if you want to leave all the definitions right by each other and instead just have a, you know, a jump to this section note in, under the R's and the H's, I'm fine with that too. So Bill, just for clarification, did yeah. you, are you suggesting under C, community character, under R, rural character, and under H, Hamlet character? I am. Okay. But, you know, I, I do hear Ernie's concern about that. And so I'm, I'm suggesting an alternate, which is we leave all that here, but we, we add an entry under R that says rural character, you know, C, discussion under community character. And under, you know, we had an entry saying Hamlet character, C, description under so do people like that idea instead? Now I have that, two motions. That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I mean, it's like everything's alphabetical and all of a sudden we have this one section that's not alphabetical. I, mean, I guess the question in my mind is where did, I mean, you know, these, these terms come up in various places, um, but where's, good, where's the rubber gonna hit the road? I mean, where, where, Importantly, in the main document, do these terms appear? Does anybody remember? Yeah, well, I looked it up and community character appears 12 different times in the document. So I can't point to you the one spot that it is because it's actually several places. 
rural character appears 10 different times in, in the whole zoning document. The one that doesn't show up very often is Hamlet character. That's only five times. And that is mostly when we define the Hamlet district. So that is the one that is sort of restricted into where it shows up in the zoning document. But the other two are, are more widely scattered. That's all I can tell you. No, that's, that's good to you. I, I kind of like having the definitions close together just so you can understand everything a little better. You could also maybe just change it to character, then something I call community, character, rural, character, him. Yeah, that's, that's another way to do it. I mean, uh, I like that too. Yeah, I like that better than the referring to, you know, refer back to this other section type thing. Bill, would you like to withdraw your motion? I, I, I'm fine. Yeah, you know, whatever. Sure, MC I'll withdraw that. Uh, Bruce's motion of character commas makes sense to people. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but I think Bill had um, had suggested some edits. Didn't yeah. you? Yes, I have some. You know, they're fairly minor, and we can go through that. Uh, I don't. Know if, let's see. You want me to put that up? Sure. Um, okay, let me see if I can, <coughs> excuse me, grab this. Uh, da, 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 da. I am uh, pawing my way to the right directory. There we go. You get a little closer to your screen, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I know. So you, you guys are probably seeing me. Uh, I'm looking over the top of my glasses, you know? They're bifocals, but it doesn't do me enough good. Yeah, sorry. I just saw your cataract. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, believe me, yeah, those are coming too. All right, let's see. Oh, All right, so it's really this one. Okay, so, and now I need to share screen. All right. All right, I mean, so the first one was in, in a rural character, I made a very minor edit. Uh, Nan had the phrase outside of Hamlets, but I'm just, you know, I changed it to in contrast to Hamlets. Um, and I inserted the word rural here. Uh, but under Hamlet character, again, I made it a bit more parallel to the rural, rural character def definition, but the main changes I think I had, uh, you know, uses the word, words like our Hamlets have, and that's, you know, I mean, I don't think that's appropriate in a definition, you know, Caroline's Hamlets have or Hamlets have. Um, so, and then um, I didn't think that, uh, oh, then the last part of what she had under Hamlet character basically referred to non-Hamlets saying that outside of Hamlets, we have a variety of housing types. I didn't think that need to be under the definition of Hamlet character. So that's sort of the motivation for, for the changes. I changed the first sentence to parallel the way it was written for a rural character that it describes, da 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 da, and then you know uh, because you can see what I wrote there. So that's my suggested edits. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that. Uh, tell me if anyone has any trouble with Bill's rewriting, which I think is very nice. Anyone? No, I think it's good. Good. So with that, we are going to have character comma um character comma hamlet character comma rural character comma community we also had this last paragraph that says community character which i think should be added under the first paragraph then yes yes absolutely that's the one that has abc up to g with right. that as an idea all in favor of that we, hi hi uh, Fabulous. Okay, Bill, I'm going to need you to send me that your changes and then I will incorporate them. Okay, I mean, I, I, I don't mind doing it again. I did. That's what I sent in that email. Um, Sunday I, ju night, I, I, just, think. I just inserted them in here. Okay, uh, then you'll have to just send your thing to Nan. Uh, yeah, right. Right. Okay, so that's fine. And, and, and Jean, if you want me to, I'm happy to send it to you. No, no, no worries. Well, I think I have it at home. So that's great. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Okay, so we're, there we are. We're now on to compatible and complete application. 
Okay, uh -huh. yeah, and I have one question on complete application when we get down there. Um, let me see where it is again. Again, you know, some of my notes date from like weeks ago. So I had to remind myself why I wrote what I wrote, but uh, it seems to me complete application, that definition is rather limiting or limited. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have thought that a complete application is an application that has met all the requirements for review, period. Not just seeker and, you know, a neg deck and, you know, all that. That whatever other requirements your view board might have have been met, that makes the application complete. You would say an application for development that has met all, um, of the all the requirements of the application. I mean, again, it's where does this occur in the mm -hmm. document? What yeah, happened? I have I have no idea. It may be. I think it may be in the site plan, and it's like the review board won't take up an application until it's complete. You know, something like that. So site plan requires an application. Subdivision requires an application. Um, right. And as well as seeker requires an application. So I think a building right permit. that it should be a complete application is an application of any type. That yeah, that has met all the applicable requirements or something like that. It needs, all, the yeah. that you know, all the requirements required in the application. I don't, um, okay, I think that makes sense, too. It meets all the requirements of the type of application, something like that. Met all the applicable requirements for that application. Wonder why that's there. Oh, so no, so now poor Barb is doing what she did not want to do, which is have to edit this document. So thank you, Barb. I, she is really good at this. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so I am doing that in, I don't know. Okay. I think we've got uh, that. I'm going to say I, yes, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Composting facility. Okay. Comp plan, town of Caroline. A CAFO. Conservation easement. Conservation subdivision. All right, I have one thing on that. Uh, my note says delete the sales job of the last sentence. Yeah, so I think that uh, the last sentence does not need to be part of the definition. Again, it's not that I disagree with the sentiment, but I don't think it's part of the definition that they result in flexibility of design, et cetera, to promote the best land, most appropriate use of land. So mm -hmm. I, I move that we delete that sentence. Yes, I think we can delete that sentence. Yeah. I, I agree. Okay, so we're deleting that sentence. Is that good with you, Aaron? Aaron yeah. er, Ian, Bruce. Bruce, yeah. Yep. Delete, okay. Scott. Consistent in scale. And Ernie has uh, to, I've, it's kind of vague. Right. And I agree. And I Hi. searched. And the only place consistent in scale appears is right here in the definitions. Okay. Well, then I say let's oh. get rid of it. Yeah. Now Nan's arguing that something here is needed. Um, you know, probably the word consistent is used, but the phrase consistent in scale, I didn't find in the, the zoning law. I'm going to put it in yellow and ask her if she's found it. I think it is used, at least okay. maybe in those three words. But Yes, and that may be the problem. But I think that uh, in, certainly in the, uh, uh, the design standards, I'm pretty sure that the concept is in there. Um, okay. Okay. So... Would you want to then edit the words at all, Ernie, to make it better? Oh, I just, you know, I, I, I find it difficult. Uh, things are, are thrown out and they're really left to the board to kind of decide what they mean. Right. You know, and, and, uh, it's always a little, a little troublesome, but you know there are cases where that's really kind of unavoidable, and I think this may be one. Uh, so the the last sentence there, sentence in terms of size, height, bulk, intensity, and aesthetics to the surrounding and character of the community as a whole, that's definitely in part of the document yeah. in other places. Yeah. Um, okay. 
So I've marked that just to see, to have us go back and think about it again. I think we just. We should accept it? Accept it. Okay. Yeah. Get on the loop. We're accepting it. Fabulous. So what, leave it as is? Leave as is. Leave as is. Great, okay. Convenience store mini mart. Uh, corner lot that's been added because we removed it from the other thing. A uh, critical environmental area, which is, it's a, it's a state definition. Yeah. Critical or rare habitat or species, again, a state definition. Crops, livestock, and livestock products. Customary use. Oh my God, we're onto the Ds. Okay, dark skies. This is an issue, the term given to the night sky that remains unimpacted by outdoor light pollution and dark sky compliant. We had some things about. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do we want to do with that? So, so I had a suggestion on dark sky compliance and um, I can, I mean, did, I don't know if again, that was, I think sent Sunday night, you know, it's kind of not that much time from then to now. Uh, and there it is, great. So um, for those listening in from the public who didn't get, of course, my email or for those who didn't chance to, to look at it. So um, as far as I can tell, and we went through this when we did the solar law, there aren't really like specifications uh, the International Dark Sky Association has. Um, what they have is principles that they think good lighting should conform to. And they call them the five principles for responsible outdoor lighting. And you know, that's a formal document that they and this um, Illumining Engineering Society of North America uh, wrote and, and put out there. Uh, and then in addition, the Dark Sky Association has a model like zoning law or model, whatever, lighting ordinance, so I should call it lighting ordinance. And in that ordinance, they divide, they give basically five different possible light levels for, uh, for zones that you, you pick. Either it's like a really, really low light level because that's your you know, basically natural unlit area all the way through your center of town, which you're, they expect to have a fairly high ambient light level. And then the appropriate fixtures will be different. The, the rating for the fixture will be different depending on are you targeting a, a, a low light level, a medium light level, or a high ambient light level. So they don't have one set of specifications. So I'm suggesting, and this is the language we adopted basically for the solar law, is that the light, dark sky compliant means that it complies with their five principles. And then when we get to the actual lighting stuff in the zoning law, that then we'll really crack into, okay, you know, what are the actual appropriate levels of lighting um, in, that we want to specify? And again, I think almost always it will only apply to commercial properties anyway. But anyway, so that's my suggestion. And so I'm, I'm making the motion that we change complies with the specifications of to the phrase that Barb has inserted. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll, just, I'll just say that, you know, in the town of Ithaca, um, they instituted dark sky compliant wording into their requirements and you know basically you go to a lighting catalog and you just pull up the cut sheet and down the corner it'll say dark sky compliant and you send that in and, and, and you're done um you know there's no no question about what zone you're in or anything else so great just uh, well, well, well that's great that's, that's not what i saw and that's why i think we need to deal with that when we get to that section because i did the best i could to understand what was going on and i may have it wrong so oh, no you have it wrong ernie you have it right. Um, I, I think you, you're 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 exactly right here. Just uh, okay. So it's 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 a term that's bandied about and is not used very accurately. Um, so okay. cool. Okay, so I think we're good with that. Uh, daycare, um, daycare, and then there's daycare home, which is how I would make it rather than home daycare. daycare I agree. Home. And I, someone has in a home residence of three to six children, yep. And then daycare facility. Um, and then density residential. Well, so well, one question on the daycare. So, so Ernie had a comment on the daycare stuff about, you know, gee, could some of us be in conflict with New York State regs? I think it's a, an excellent 
comment and point. I guess my thought is that it's actually probably okay if we're in conflict with the state that you know we, we can set different levels limits or definitions that apply in Caroline as I understand it. Um, we can't do something that's like illegal under New York state law. So I'm wondering if it's okay to have these definitions the way they are or if we indeed need to do something like Ernie's saying was do we need to pay attention to what New York state how they define it. I started to look at this you know a month or so ago and, and it just it's really complicated you know as to you know <coughs> The definitions and how the staffing has to work and all of this other stuff. So, so I actually think that this is probably fine because it's big enough that nobody's going to come here and and say, well, the town said I could have this daycare facility even though it's not licensed by the state. Right. Um, you know. So as, as long as we're not not you know aiding and abetting. Um, you know, non-compliant daycare facilities. I'm, 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 I'm not having any problems with this. Uh, so, okay, I can actually run those three by um, the child care council. Do you have the child? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and just say, you know, are, Melissa, are these fine? And she'll say yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Good. Okay, I will do that. I will run the daycare by Melissa. Let me write that down, or the words go right out of my head. Okay, uh, density comma residential. I think we've talked about that. And then that would be density comma gross and density so, comma net, I think. Yeah, so it's both gross density and net density, as far as I can tell, aren't used. Um, but I could be, you know, I, again, I did a search on gross density, a search on net density. And if they are used, but with like, slightly different wording, I would not have found it. I mean, we definitely, we definitely have, you know, a, our, our minimum, you know, our maximum residential density, but do we ever actually talk about gross density or net density in the document? And I couldn't find it, but does anybody else remember it? I don't. I remember net density being discussed um, somewhere. Okay, I'm gonna make a well, note of it in yellow and, and ask but, I think that the, you know, um, I mean, the definitions are fine. If you want to find I have them. a question. I have a question about the steep slopes. Here it says greater than 15%. Don't we say greater than 25% someplace else? We do. Or something else. Uh, look under net buildable acreage. But look under buildable acreage uh, to see what we said there. I'm pretty sure it's 25 there, but. Yeah, it's yeah, just 25. 25. So why why are they different? A mistake, probably. Yeah, it's probably a typo. So I'm gonna highlight that slightly differently in here. And okay, so that's what we're doing with gross and net is just we're gonna question that. So steep slope is 25%, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we had said. So density bonus, this, if we have density bonuses, is what it would be. And then design standards, development, disturbance. Uh, oh, wait, 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 sorry, design standards. I had a note here, so I'm a little slow on the draw. Um, uh, then there are card standards. Oh, okay, never mind. She changed the definition. That's fine. Never mind. Okay, disturbance. This is about disturbing the land. Which I, I thought that was an okay definition. Uh, oh, did I do something on that one? No, not there. Never mind. Well, uh, Ernie has a comment on the side there, but I can't tell what it refers to. She has land disturbance further down. And so it's just a question of when we get to land disturbance, whether we have disturbance defined two different ways in two different places. Okay, so let's, um, I'm gonna just mark that, thinking that it's sort of okay at the moment. Well, let's, let's just get back to it if we have to. Yeah. Okay, uh, drive-through or drive-in facility. Um, that's, you know, like a, a food drive-in or picking up prescriptions, that kind of a drive-in. Yeah. Dwelling kind right. of- So a good question about this would be, you know, things like, is a gas station a drive-through facility? 
So just well, you have to stay in the, you have to remain in the motor vehicle on the premises. So our gas stations, you have to get out, right? Somebody has to get out, yeah. In New Jersey, you don't, but here you do. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. There's, um, there's still some self or service. I, I just, you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody understands that what the driving facility is. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Remember, at some point, the question came up, you know. Okay. Gas station, you know, you drive through it. Is, is this a drive through facility? And, well, no, of course not. Okay. Dwelling common multifamily. So this says occupied by three or more families with the number of families and residents not exceeding the number of dwelling units provided. Okay. That's what we said, right? Yes. Yeah. I've, I've got no problem with any of the dwelling definitions. Yeah. Okay. But, um, uh, single families, dwelling two family, dwelling unit. Um, single family. It, the last sentence. I don't know if she changed it. This uh, shall include manufactured homes when affixed to a permanent foundation. Yeah. Uh, go, go back. I can't. I can't read that. You're... Uh, it says. Which one is it? Dwelling, dwelling single family. Single family. Oh, single dwelling family. Single family. design is one. So we talked about we talked about this a little bit about how sometimes. Um, Manufacturing like, arms are they're not tied down, but then we said that <clears throat> well they're affixed in order yeah. to, to meet the building code. I mean right. can, you don't want these things blowing foundations. Right. Um, yeah, it, it was in a previous definition where it said permanently attached. And so the objection was raised to permanently attached. So right. I think the affixed is okay because that means you've tied yeah. it so it won't blow away, uh, but it's not permanent. Right. Okay. So a permanent foundation would be piers also? Piers, but then there's some sort of hold down that you know keeps the pier down. Keep, keep, keeps the, the building from blowing off okay. the piers. I'm just, just asking because permanent foundation to me sounds like a foundation. Uh, if a permanent if a pier is a permanent foundation, I'm fine. I, I think a pier is a permanent foundation. Okay. And there, there are regulations for how manufactured yeah. homes have to be attached to the ground. Okay, so I'm going on to ease, the ease. We're ready for the ease. Yeah. Okay. Economic impact assessment. Oh. Electric vehicle charging station, enforcement officer, uh, EIS, an environmental impact statement, event facility, existing lots of record. Right, wait, wait. I had not noticed that before. So I think it's fine. But there yeah. you go. So that's the definition of original lot. It's existing lot of record. So so that's the official term for it. So back anyway, and look now we know. Existing lot of record in the other definition. Uh, where's the environmental? Change. Yeah. Original lot. Okay. Um, Farm, brewery, winery, cidery, or distillery. Farm market. So rather than original lot, I could say, wait a second, Barb's working on the, uh, okay, I'm going to find. Oops. Where are we? Farm market? Yes, farm market. Set. And that one, farm market yeah. was, was the next one down. And it seems to be, is it crossed out? Mm -hmm. Looks like it's crossed out. It, it's in this one. It's not crossed out that I'm using. I don't know why. Yeah, mine's not. Oh, it was, just, it was just moved from one area to another. There were two farm markets. Ah, OK. OK, so farm market is then. It's, uh, still, it's still there. Yeah, OK. And the, right. And then farmland and farm brewery, winery, cidery, or distillery is doubled, I think is what happens. It's in here twice. So right. yes, yes. Okay. So one of them needs to go. Okay, so that's good. So then we have farm worker housing uh, and farmlands of statewide importance. Yeah, farm stand before that. Yeah, farm stand. 
farm stand is 400 square feet in size? Not more size? than. Not more than. Not more than. Okay, is, is that? Yeah, because farm market was 400. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, farm land, farm worker housing, farm lands of statewide importance, flood damage prevention, local law, um, which is, that's ours, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Floodplain, food and beverage, food processing on farm. I just noticed that flood damage law needs to be updated because. Oh. We have a, that said 2011, right? Yeah. So, so it's we, been changed. Yeah. I'm going to make a note somewhere. and I will find it. Yeah. I'll get it for you. Thank you. Yeah. Needs to be updated. You just did that. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Food and beverage, food processing on farm, formula business. I think that's the definition we've been using. Frontage, fuel station. Gasoline fuel station, which would be fuel station gasoline. I think. Yeah. But then what do you do with the electrical vehicle charging station? I don't know. Fuel station electric vehicle. <laughs> Excellent. Fuel station. Thank you, Ernie. This time of night, my brain does not work. So electric vehicle, fuel station comma electric vehicle. Or charging is fine there. That's good. Okay, funeral home, glare, greenhouse gas, greenhouse slash nursery, gross floor area, guideline, habitat, hazardous material, means, and then there's, it's quite long. I'm assuming this comes from all sorts of regulations. Yeah, I mean, again, that, that language is almost certainly taken directly from the site plan law and where that language came from, I don't know, but probably from a state definition of hazardous material, be my guess. I'm just gonna put in a comment here that says, is this the same? as site plan law, because it would be useful if it were. But other than that, we seem happy. Health medical clinic slash laboratory. Home occupation major and home occupation minor. We had yes. some discussions about. Yeah. So. I mean, you can accept the one I sent, or I do think that there is no limit on the number of person. I think, it should, anyway, that just seems weird. <laughs> so, but. Yeah. So, uh, well, so it, I think a major home occupation might only employ one or two people. If it otherwise has huge signs and lots of traffic and lots of, coming and going. So I don't like saying employees more than three full-time equivalents. Um, you might just not mention number of employees at all in that definition, I, I don't know. Or people disagree, maybe, maybe to be a major home occupation, you have to have at least three employees. No, I, I, think it, I think the two things have to work together. I think it's like the, you know, the footprint, the signage, I, I think it's exactly what I said today, it's and or, it, you know, it's, um, yeah, it could be just the foot, it could be just the vehicles and all that, or it could be the number of people. No, I agree with Bill. I think you just don't mention how many employees for the main. <coughs> it's only, only a restriction to get it into a minor. Yeah, as long as they pertain to the rest of it, yeah. that would be. So we're defining home occupation major now as having these characteristics of. Um, that there is a sign that um, there's people coming in and out daily. There's the storage of business products, waste, equipment, and it includes bed and breakfast because that's defined. 
uh, businesses associated with agritourism are not considered home occupations because those are farm occupations. Well, so so the, I do have the, the reason. Ahead, the reason for the reason for including the language that said there is no limit on the number of persons employed was to it was to clarify the questions that are sure to come up. That um, you know, how many people? If if minor is up to three. Right. Um, how many can I have if I'm major? And that's the point that you can have one if you're major, but if you've got a sign and vehicles and everything else, you're still major. And so that was the purpose of including there is no limit on the number of persons employed. Yeah, I still find it odd phrasing. I think, I mean, one of the key things is that for a home occupation, it is supposed to be and must be secondary and subordinate to the use of the dwelling for living. Because I mean, people might march in saying, you know, yeah, I've got 10 employees, but it's taking place on my property and, and so I'm a home occupation. But, you know, if you've got one little house and five business buildings, you're not a home occupation. So I think that that's a key phrase and I, I just don't see the need to mention the employees. I am still questioning the, the phrase of bed and breakfast. I mean, does that mean a bed and breakfast is a major home occupation? I think it, I think it means that in order to be a bed and breakfast, it has to be your home, is what I think it's referring to, but I don't know why it's under major. I mean, a home yeah, we already does include one. It must, it must be defined under bed and breakfast. Isn't yeah, it? Under, under bed and breakfast, we say that the, you know, it's owner occupied because that's, I think, state law um, per Ernie. Right. Um, so I don't understand why it's. I don't understand why it appears under the home occupation, unless there's some feeling that a bed and breakfast is a home occupation, but people might think it's not. And so we have to make sure people realize it's a home occupation. But, but it is yeah, part of the you know, signage. You don't have a bed and breakfast without having a sign. For one thing. Yeah, but you're allowed to have a small sign as a, I mean, yeah, I don't know. My vote is to take out the reference to bed and breakfast, but I wanted to hear from Nan or somebody that maybe there's a, a good reason to have it referenced, but I don't see why it's a major one, um, a major home occupation. I, I would agree about taking out the reference. I don't think it's needed because it's already defined under bed and breakfast. What do other people think? I, I'm fine with taking it out. And do we and do we think we need the this the line that says um, there is no limit on the number of persons employed? I can agree with Barb and the point she made. It just helps to clarify. Okay. And 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 I don't care enough. So whatever, I'll go with Barb and Ernie. Okay, I agree. And Michelle. I'll go with Barbara and Ernie also. Okay, so that's good. And we're at this point, we're taking out the reference to bed and B and Bs because I don't think it's needed there. But with that, we're moving on. Home okay. occupation minor. So this is the one that basically says it's uh, up to three persons in addition to the owner operator. And, and that needs to say full time equivalent employees or something. Yes, I agree. Up to three FTEs. Well, we probably need to spell it out the first time we use it. Full-time equivalent employees. And I was wondering why it has to be a non-farm related business. Because, uh, because I think farm related is exempt. Okay. Right. Okay. Basically, as Naz pointed out, you know, there's state ag and markets law that supersedes local stuff for, for a farm business. Okay. So then do we need to have it in there? No. I think it's just for clarity. We don't have to have it though. Just to kind of defuse the question before it comes up. Yeah, yes. I think you mean the last sentence. I, I think it should be there just to say that it's not what we're talking about. Okay. okay. Hunting, pre hunting preserve and shooting club out, outdoor. Okay, let's not hunt and decide, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I got some big practice. <laughs> a, a shooting club. I'm not sure if we should just call it a sportsman's club. I don't know. And I'm wondering where we come up with the dates. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm agreeing with Ernie's comment that there should be some way to take out all this huge verbiage and refer to, you know, as regulated by the state or some, I don't know what the right wording is, but, you know, basically DEC statutes or whatever are stuffed in here. And I think that um, makes it just yeah. wordy. Yeah, but you also find that I don't believe those dates are pertinent at all. Right, because those, those are changed, right? I mean, uh, I mean, if it, if it was a, a rabbit hunting preserve, it would be October to something. And yeah. if it was a okay. turkey, it's another thing. Yeah, every date would be different. If it's trout season. Yeah, because yeah. this is game birds that she's talking about. And that's yeah. not. And, and I agree with what Barb's typing in the comment there was basically, we now basically oh. tossed that in Nan's lap to, to figure out the right way to replace that with okay. a reference to state standards. So I'm putting that in yellow and we're going to stick that in. Uh, hydric soil, which is, that's the definition of hydric soil. Impervious surface. I'm going to put in a space after driveways because it needs it. Um, then we go on to industrial light manufacturing. Um, and then there's industrial use heavy, but Ernie has said, is industrial heavy manufacturing allowed anywhere? And Nan says, yes, it is used in the site plan law. For now, I would leave it in. If it is taken out of the site plan review, then we can remove this, which is industrial use heavy, but, does, but is that the same thing as industrial manufacturing heavy? I'm not sure. Yeah, I know, but, but yeah, Ernie's right. We, you know, we don't in our use table allow heavy industry anywhere. But again, because the site plan law was written before that, it still has that verbiage in it. So she copied the definition and yeah, I think it's probably fine to have it in there. Uh, but whether it's industrial use heavy or industrial heavy use, I don't care. Okay, I'm gonna also mark that in yellow and have a conversation and we'll see where it goes. Institutional uses, which is, you know, churches, synagogues, mosques, libraries, etc. Intermittent stream. That's the okay, Well, Ernie had raised a question. I it's sort of about because is that okay with the honor that it refers to all those different kinds of institutions? What, 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 what? Institutional so, use. Ernie, is institutional that use is, is not just government use, but a lot of other things are wrapped in there, and you had raised a note saying that basic government uses should not be lumped in with religious uses, daycares, et cetera. Um, yeah, because I think we, we have government stuff under our use tables as opposed. To yeah, so I think I had a note, right. So I think under G, I can't remember, some draft or other had a government use definition or maybe it should that I don't think this has it, and I'm going to make a note to find it and put it in yellow. Okay. Government use. Government or institutional offices or facilities. So, so we do hold them. Together. Yes. Ah, so in that case, are we happy about that? Okay. I can make the definition government or institutional. Yeah, it just seems that, you know, government buildings are different than churches. To me. <laughs> you know. Under the Constitution. Well, yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, I'm not clued into the philosophy is why would one say these institutional uses have their own definition because we somehow treat them, you know, as a category. I And I'm clueless as to whether we ever do or don't. Well, why don't we just call it government or institutional uses and then the definition applies, I think. It's a big lump of stuff. Um, you know, we got daycare centers, cemeteries, funeral homes, nursing home, group home, fire right. station. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, because I have a note here saying that we have, and you must have found it, government or institutional offices or facilities was a definition that said an office specifically related to local, state, county, or federal government functions which seems fine. And then maybe do we take government out of this one? I don't know. 
mean, I don't know that there's any reason to separate them out, but just... Okay, I am going to go back to institutional use and take out government owned or operated building structure or land used for public purpose or but those a lot of the others are land use for perfect public purpose i'm going to take out or government owned or operated building we have definitions of funeral homes and other things in this like daycare yeah so do we need that whole set other sentence yeah, i'm going mean, to does institutional use occur in a in the use table yeah i, I don't institutional use does i think of government or institutional use yes but then but then we would have daycare centers as a, as a separate line item. Right. So that's just now we're calling them institutional use right so we need to i'm going to make a maybe note get, here maybe get rid of this entire well, that, that, that would tend to be my suggestion, but I think that that needs someone to go through carefully and make sure that every term is defined that needs to be, like, do we need to define religious right. use? In so I'm saying, can we get rid of this entirely and marking the thing in yellow and we'll figure it out. I'll ask man to figure that out this week. Okay, intermittent stream, junk scrap or salvage yard. I will like to say something. Sure. Bill, I checked with Barry. He hasn't got back to me about the stream buffers. Okay. And also, guy from the DEC is out till the end, near the end of the week, so I'll get to him as soon as he's in. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Kennel commercial. Oh, sorry. Junkyard, uh, scrap, or salvage yard. Um, I agree with um, Ernie's objection to the highlighted sentence there. Um, it, you know, this has no relevance. Um, there is no thing that says, oh, a junk car yard appears in our use table in some way, or that there's a town law that deals with junk car yards. There's, uh, so I think we can delete that sentence. I move that. Okay. Which sentence we delete? To deposit on a lot of two or more old or secondhand motor vehicles no longer intended or in condition for legal use on the public highway shall be deemed to make the lot a junk car yard. I mean, Ernie's point was, you know, so what are the implications of being called a junk car yard? And as far as I know, there are none unless someone on the town board elsewhere knows. Uh, but I don't think we specify junk car yard anywhere in the zoning law. Right. I can't see it, but it looks like Nan has a response to Ernie's comment, but I can't see it. Um, this is from New York State law. Yeah, I was going to say. And then it would have to meet New York State junk car laws. Now we have we have a well, so, so, so let's have a separate definition for junk car yard i think new york state law is two or, or more cars on a lot i feel like i need yeah. to go back and read local law two isn't local law two the one about junk i believe it is yeah there's the beautification law right yeah, it's got some weird name. It's not even beautification. It's, right. It's it's like you, have to search for you it. would have to know what the hell you were looking for. Right. So I'm going to mark that yellow. I'm going to go look at local law two because local law two does appear in one of the use tables as a look at local law two. Right. And and I'm pre and you should because you know my memory is not always perfect. I don't remember it saying something about that. There there might be because I think there is some limits on how many non-operational vehicles you can have on your yard and stuff. So right. yeah, let's check that. Okay, I will go check that. Um, let's do K, which is kennel comma commercial, which seems fine. Well, my question is when it says any number of dogs, I think that would be regulated by the square footage law, correct? I mean, because any number of dogs could be Uh, Nan says you can have any number here you feel is right for Caroline. Um, like any place at which there is any number of dogs for the primary purpose of sale or for the boarding care or breeding for which a fee is charged or paid. I don't know. I've never designed a kennel. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, at that point you could be, you know, I got a, a 
a box of kittens, I'm now a commercial <laughs> cat, cattle. I right. mean, there's, there's no threshold here. Um, okay, so, so what is that? Uh, the per primary purpose of sale or for the board care and breeding. So I, I, think, I think it's probably sufficient. Um, so any place, you could say any place, uh, a place. The well, I mean, so so here here's here's the rub. Um, you know, basically, somebody has a, has a has a beautiful dog. They they want to have puppies and sell the offspring. Um, fairly benign. Don't even have a sign in the front yard. It's not hurt nobody. No how. Why are we calling it commercial? So well, I, but in that case, Ernie, that's not the primary purpose of the of keeping that dog. Any, right? the, at which the primary purpose of, the, of that dog, of that situation, dog. the situation you're describing, the primary purpose is that dog's a pet, right? It's not the primary purpose for sale or boarding. Unless it's a breeder, a, a good dog. I don't see primary purpose here anywhere. It's in there. Any, it is, it says oh, oh, for the primary purpose of sale. Yeah, or boarding. So that so the, the situation you're describing, the primary purpose of that dog is it's a family pet that they happen to sell its puppies. Well, it's maybe, not, maybe they maybe they actually do you know want to breed, but they're breeding you know one one brood you know not it's not a puppy mill. No. Um, I don't know. I mean, I you know, I don't have any problem with this the way it's written. I just I just think it's a quibble. I, well, I, but I could see somebody, you know, making a mole out of an anthill here. <laughs> oh, boy, that's a mix. <laughs> if you ever heard one. Um, yeah, I, I can see that with any number of dogs because then it would come up to like a state regulation. Like, say they have huge amounts of animals. When you say any number of dogs, I would say more like... Uh, I, I think I, we can leave it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not let's sure. Just, let's just leave it. Okay. I, it's really, somebody's going to get their underwear and not over somebody selling some puppies and we can. Uh, I'm going to stop at K. And, Good. Okay. Okay, because it is almost 9.15 and I have two other things I think I want to say. We are meeting again next Tuesday because this is such fun. And we're going to try to get through the rest of this. I will get all of this stuff to Nan with our questions and stuff, and so that you can prepare. You mean we're going to get another list? Um, maybe one knows. I yeah. And Barbara and I will confer and send off a document to Nan that says this is what we did tonight. Um, and could you just ask for the number of pages just to be? And we'll number the pages because they should always be yeah, numbered. I agree. Easier. I will write that down too, because if I don't, it will go right out of my head. Um, I, I will not be in attendance next week. Okay. We will miss you. I will too. You lie. You lie. Lying like I see lying like a rug. Lying like a rug. What category does that Um okay. So um, I'm not even going to try to guess when we're going to finish this. When we finish this, we are going to then, with the terms, we're going to go back. We're going to get a final document from Nan. We're all going to read it and see if it agrees with what we think we've done. When we agree upon that in the meeting, we will post it up on the website and we will set a date not less than two weeks from that time to have a public information meeting. Okay? Yes. Good. There was also some discussion of meeting with the uh, uh, site plan review committee. Yes. When is the review board meeting? Have they decided? Do you know? Uh, they did, but I'm not. They got changed so many times. I believe now it's maybe the 14th, but I'm not sure. I didn't see. I and Gene, I suggest that we meet. You know, if the reviewer wants to talk to us, great, because I know they're looking at the sections, but they should talk to us when we finish and get this out the door, because that's when we're going to turn our attention to articles four, five, and six. I, and I don't see any reason to meet them now until we, you know, so maybe a month from now or, you know. Yeah, like I want them to look at it and send us some suggestions they have, and then maybe we do need to meet as a group. 
So I think that's good. I think we have um, we have progressed. We're up to the uh, the L's, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that there are a lot of letters at the end of the alphabet that don't have a lot. You know, like <laughs> Q, which is nice, and <laughs> and, and, and and X and Z. We're not doing anything about xylophones. So um, that makes me very happy. Okay. Um, thank you again, everyone. Thank you for your attention to this and your, and your detail. Um, I am really, I continue to be impressed by people's um, dedication to doing a good job on this. So thank you. Uh, I'll see you, except for Ernie, who's gonna be out having a good time somewhere next, next Tuesday. Okay, bye. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to go Bye. have a good time. Bye-bye. It's getting that time. Too many meetings. That time of year.